Michael Mead, welcome to the Medicine Path Podcast. Thanks for joining me today. Good to be with you, Brian. So I'm currently reading your new book, Awakening the Soul. And as I read it, I'm having this really strong feeling of recognition, as if you're putting into words things that I've felt in my heart and in my experience. And um, I have to say that having my experience affirmed by someone who I consider an elder feels like a real blessing to me. And so I just wanted to start by thanking you for writing this book. Oh, thank you. Thanks for even being interested. Yeah. I'm wondering what inspired you to write this book at this time? Well, I tend to write in a frenzy. And I'm actually, I'm always writing. And, uh, but I'm not always publishing. And then when it gets around to saying, okay, wait, this is starting to feel like a book or, or I need to express myself somehow, then I just stop doing other things for the most part and get into writing for seven or eight hours a day. And in that process, everything seems to change. And then I think it's the muses. It seems like the muses coming in in the middle of the night indicate to me which stories to tell and where to go. And, uh, and I just follow the promptings. And so it was interesting to me to end up in the end of the book talking about living in truth and then to have that subject, the subject of truth and all that's false, become so primary in the culture. And so um, in a way, you could say I was intending to have something to do, say about the culture, and in a way, I got pulled in to an eddy of thought and imagination that connects to some things happening in the culture. Mm -hmm. To open the book, you tell the story of the world weary man from ancient Egypt. And I can say that at various times in my life, I've related to his plight and his uh, sense of despair. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about this story, and I think because I think it helps to frame this uh, awakening of the soul at this time. Yeah, I've thought about that story a lot. It's a um, it's really a fragment of a papyrus skull for uh, 4,500 years ago, where someone is writing uh, about the sense of grief and sorrow and anxiety coming from the collapse of their culture. And I started reading the trans different translations of it and then started working with the translation that where I pieced it together. And then I would read it to audiences who, who would react as if someone wrote it today and then tell them that it was written 4,500 years ago which is to say we've been through this before or people have been through this before. And in the story, he becomes ready to take his own life out of a despair at the condition of culture and his ba soul, which would be like the unique soul or individual soul of a person, tells him not to do that, but to go back to his origins rather than look at the end of his life and tap into his origins and suggest that they can then live together until he's really weary of the world and dies. And so I wanted to take that and say, first of all, we've been through this before, but what's different typically now is I think a lot of people don't know they have a soul or they don't know they have a soul that's trying to guide them. And so we're in a worse condition in the sense that we have culture that's falling apart and we have the increase of anxiety and fear and depression that comes with that. But we often lack that soulful connection that tells us that you live life anyway and that there's something essential inside each of us that can contribute to life. And so I thought that maybe it was a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it feels incredibly relevant because in these times, it feels sometimes like there's no one to turn to because everyone is in their own suffering. And if the culture doesn't teach us that we can turn inward and find uh, this inner resource, this inner guidance, uh, this inner affirmation that we're meant to be here at this time and place and that we have something to contribute to the world, 
we can feel just completely lost. And added to that, you have everyone interconnected, but feeling more isolated, partially as a result. And so I went into that a little bit in the book too. What would the world weary man from 4,500 years ago think about the fact that everyone is connected uh, digitally and yet the result is greater isolation in many cases, or some people call it being alone together. And to the degree that the, um, in Britain, they've created a new cabinet post called the Minister of Loneliness in order to, <laughs> it's true, it's a real thing, <laughs> of loneliness in order to deal with the fact that people feel more lonely despite all the superficial interconnectedness, even though it's not all superficial, there's some effect that's being created where people feel ever more isolated. Yeah, it's almost like the illusion of interconnectedness that we get from social media and the internet. It, like on a surface level, makes us feel that we're really connected to everyone and everything, but it doesn't offer the same nourishment of person-to-person -person contact offers you know it's probably a lot better to have a few friends of the soul than thousands of facebook friends yeah <laughs> in the math of friendship just a few friends of the soul is better. yeah the few friends of the soul carries a lot more weight than uh thousands of virtual friends right I think so i think so. like facsimile friends or something mm. um i wonder if you could help us to because we don't really have uh, enough stories of the soul in our culture. I wonder if you could help us understand what the soul is and how it might be different or distinguished from what we think of as spirit, something out, out and up there. So the classic distinction is that spirit is connected to fire and air and it rises to up there and everything above the heavens, but also the sense that there's when, it, when it's present, the sense that there's one univer a universal oneness or even a single deity, some people will go that direction. Soul is connected to water and earth and it descends and takes us to the earth and takes us further. And a distinction that I like is that the um, spirit tends to create oneness or at least people's longing for a oneness. Soul creates great diversity and multiplicity so that uh, soul is more like the roots of the forest and, and soul is, is about uh, diverse ideas, uh, animistic feelings, all of the richness that comes with uh, diversity in the natural world that can exist in the cultural world as well. So for me, in the modern world, if, when people ask what's missing, the first answer for me is soul, the descending quality that leads to a diversity that's connected. I think that's what's missing. So that we've already referenced, you know, the kind of uh, World Wide Web, which is technologically arranged, but there's a deep soulful web in which everybody can be connected soul to soul. And then in the depth of the soul, the individual soul connects to the soul of the world, you could say, to the living soul of the world. And mm -hmm. so there's enough spirit around at times, but there's less and less soul, I think. Mm. It's interesting because I feel at this time, you know, maybe it's just who I'm connected to on social media. You know, I'm a yoga teacher and musician, and so uh, your social media connections tend to create this kind of uh, bubble or goldfish bowl of you know, reflecting back people who are, have the same interests as you and things like that. And it, it seems to me at this time that there's so much talk about uh, like individuation, expressing your, your, your truth uh, and things like that. And I'm wondering, is this the soul work that's needed or is there something lacking in that? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure how to critique that. I do think the individual soul mythologically speaking, is unique. Each person is unique. So the old phrase was nature only makes originals. 
you know, there's many pine trees, but each one is different from the other, the same thing through the animal realm. So therefore, the same thing must be true with humans. Each one is unique. The way to get connected to the universal is through the uniqueness. So that, that's the mystical idea. The short path is from an awakened uniqueness that suddenly connects to the universal. Not by letting go of one's uniqueness and folding into the universal, just the opposite. By following the spirit spark and imagination, inspiration of one's unique soul, that's how we wind up getting connected to the universal. At least that's the mystical idea. Hmm. So in a time of collapse, which it seems to me is what we're going through culturally and to some degree in nature as well, climate change, the distortions and disruptions of the ecological systems, the huge storms that are occurring as a result of that, which mirror the huge storms in culture and the collapse of cultural institutions creates the questions, where do I turn to? What do I turn like the world weary man? And my suggestion or what I've learned is we turn to the depths of our own soul where there's an inspired capacity where there's a, uh, a mixture of talents and gifts and things that we might give of ourselves, if we can awaken to what those things are, that in the midst of all the uncertainty of culture and nature, one of the few things we might count on is what is seated and woven into our own souls. And that hmm, by awakening to that and trying to live that truth, I don't mean the truth, you know, like you say, someone's going to express what is their truth. I don't mean it in the sense of the ideas that a person accumulates and thinks about and believes in. I mean some inner expression coming from within and contributing to the world. I'm talking about if that awakened in more people, then no one would have to save the world. People just have to like save themselves from being lost in the world, finding the path that they're called to, and when enough people do that, you can have a collective awakening, or if you want to call it that, a collective initiation in which people reimagine their connection to both nature and to a culture of inclusion, imagination, and creativity. Hmm. In your book, you talk about the awakening of the soul as a kind of initiatory experience. Yeah. And... It just brings to mind something that I see a lot of these days uh, where middle aged or older men are out there leading initiation weekends for younger men in an attempt to revive and recreate the rites of passage of old that we've lost in our society for the most part. And I'm wondering if this, this awakening to the soul, this initiation process is something that can be forced or if the awakening to the soul can only happen when the individual is ready for it and the circumstance of their life initiates it? Well, I think it's trying to happen all the time. So I guess maybe the first thing to say is um, maybe there's two levels of initiation. And the first level is like a little bit more what you're calling forced. So it would be like a, a predetermined cultural initiation. Here's our culture. Here's what you need to know to function in our culture. We're going to take you through a process and you'll become uh, initiated, so to speak, into cultural expectations. Then the deeper level of initiation can be seen as revealing oneself to oneself, not necessarily by oneself, but there's an awakening of the deeper self and this uniqueness that I consider so important. And um, that's more like a radical initiation. And I guess from my own experience, that doesn't happen in a weekend. In other words, uh, some of the stuff that's being called initiation may be that first level of initiation. Here's, here's some ideas that we agree on and we think this could be interesting or helpful. I'm not sure. Initiation is a radical term. In the classic sense, it involves something dying as well as something being born, and therefore it's somewhat of a dangerous dynamic to be involved with. Um, and yet, 
it is an archetype, you could say, of the human psyche, that there's an archetypal dynamic that initiation names or describes. And I think what I'm imagining is not so much something where someone organizes a weekend as much as when out of suffering or pain or longing or some combination a person does desire to awaken at a deeper level and that that can happen either through some formal process or it also happens informally the way i got into it was working with people in deep deep pain and trouble and trying to understand what's going on when a person is suffering deep deeply from loss or anguish of some kind and at the bottom of that suffering something starts to awaken and if it is supported can cause a radical transformation of that person's life and initiation was the kind of old term for that so when you look back you have you can find descriptions of classic initiations and in tribal cultures but when taken on as a psychological dynamic it's happening all the time or trying to happen Every time someone has a serious loss, the soul doesn't go, oh, they lost so-and-so. I don't think that's what happens deep down. I think the soul says, we're, excuse me, we're in an initiation again, that something is trying to be initiated through deep loss, through pain. Uh, a person uh, creates the circumstances that propels them into a bigger sense of life, even though it starts with losing some sense of life. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what I mean by initiation. And it's a lifelong process. And I think where I get some permission to work with it is by seeing it as an archetypal dynamic in the human psyche that may be overlooked now or forgotten by culture, but it still exists at the level of the soul. That's how I engage it. Hmm. Yeah. And I'm wondering when you started to do your work with at risk youth and gang members to basically what's to follow what sounds like the calling of your own soul to do this work in the world. I'm wondering if that was difficult for you to step into because those kind of situations aren't easy. You know, I've been in a few of them myself. Well, I think um, things are easier if you feel called to it rather than curious about it. And um, I was at a point in my life where I had been, um, I, I had benefited from, from whatever it was. I had more money than I'd ever had before. I had more freedom than I'd ever had before. And it inspired me to want to give back. It was, it was a strange thing. At first, I realized, oh, I just received something. I want to give something. And I thought, well, where where's the part of culture that I might likely be able to contribute to? And I grew up kind of rough. And so I had an affection and sympathy for, for boys and girls, any young people that are trying to enter their own uh, grown life and trying to enter culture and are at some disadvantage because of race or uh, poverty or, or ethnicity. And I thought maybe I could go there and try to be helpful. And what happened was in encountering the severe pain and often great oppression uh, that people are going through, maybe increasingly in the world, um, the only way I could handle it was to imagine it as an inadvertent underworld initiation that's already underway when I get there. If, if you take initiation as three steps, some kind of separation from the, um, the collective or separation from the family or whatever that separate separation issue is that leads to a liminal uh, area of uncertainty and ordeal that is aimed at um, uh, being welcomed eventually back into some knowing community, those would be the three steps, then I was considering all the young people that were on the streets and in the gangs and all as separated from the culture. They'll tell you that they're not part of the culture. 
and as in a liminal space that's undefined and radical in many ways, and living through an ordeal, and what was missing was maybe some consciousness of those steps, and the other thing that's almost always missing is the third step, step of being welcomed back and reassimilated, as they say in anthropology, but by a knowing group of people that see the suffering someone has been through. So I thought here's perhaps a, an honest place to bring uh, learning and knowledge about initiation because the first two steps have already happened. And so we're going back to your original idea, whereas in a weekend situation, typically or often people have to create the sense of those steps um, in sometimes in artificial or whatever psychological ways in order to get into the material that's trying to awaken through the initiatory steps. And so I thought here's a place where the initiation is underway without anybody knowing about it. I call it underworld initiation. So I just brought all the ideas of initiation to where the suffering was. And, and that felt to me honest. It felt to me not artificial and not cooked up. But here it was, can we bring knowledge of initiation? Can we create what I call temporary community enough to welcome those back that have been in the lands and territories of suffering? That was the process as I saw it. One of the things that I've been uh, thinking about is how difficult it can be to live a soulful life in a culture that's forgotten the soul. And I'm thinking about also when you're talking about initiation, that welcoming back into a knowing community. And I think that's often lacking for, for anybody really, but especially those kids who have been on the streets or been involved with gangs to not have a community that recognizes some transformation in them, that they have a gift to offer the world. What happens when there's not that community there to receive us, to nurture us, to support us in following our soul's call? Well, there's an increasing sense of isolation. There's a decrease of any kind of inner confidence, not, not, you know, not conference to, confidence to be like special or something, but confidence has confide in it. Like I can't really confide enough with others who I think I might be. I can't even confide to the world what I might have to offer. We begin to feel diminished in all those ways. And so there's a real trick. On one hand, we lost typical rites of passage um, which is one form of, initi of initiation. We've lost most of the initiation understanding, and it's been lost mostly throughout the world, as if archetypes wax and wane like other things do. Mm. And, um, and so it leaves us hmm, psychologically more adrift, less connected, um, both to culture and in a way to nature, because initiatory awakenings awaken the deep inner nature, which is naturally connected to great nature. So we lose on both sides. And so the, the damage is that we don't have what some people might call formal rites of passage. Um, and then if we try to generate it, we also have to generate a community that can understand, appreciate, and welcome people back from their trails of learning and suffering. And so it's a lot to do at once. And so I began to think about it as temporary community or even sudden community. Like we're working in the streets with gang kids and all. And one interesting thing about people who are marginal is they're not as tied to the collective ideas and the collective patterns of the given community. They're already on the edge. They're actually much closer to awakening in some situ in some ways and in some cases. And when what we just did was try to take those who are most at risk and say there's two risks here. One is you can continue possibly to get lost and alienated, but the other risk is you could actually awaken uh, rather quickly because you're less contained and limited by the collective agreements. And so we would just create a temporary community 
of all the young people involved or people from the neighborhood or however we could. And we would try to bring them into a, a more awakened state of what they've suffered, who they might be inside that suffering, what calling might be there in their life. And when they're ready, have them welcomed into a community that in that moment is seeing them as qualified essentially at the level of their soul, no matter where they have come from or even what they have done. And then it just requires a lot of being present with what's happening. Hmm. I think uh, maybe you'd agree that it's important that some part of that community, some connection to that experience of awakening stays with the person uh, to support them and to not let them just uh, be cast adrift, you know. And so where does the responsibility for that come from? You know, who can we have to, in what way? to be there for the, the person post initiation? Yeah. Well, we wouldn't, we're not calling that an initiation per se. I'm saying I was using the model and the archetype of, of initiation to, to understand what a, um, a creative working with the soul issues there might be. So I'm not saying they're initiated or telling them that or even using that language with them. Um, so, um, and then you're right, what's the responsibility? The old responsibility of initiation, when you initiate someone, you're responsible partially for their life. Contrary to what people think now, who you have initiated has a kind of um, uh, a right to call on you to continue to help them. Hmm. It's like the old Chinese story of uh, the guy walking across the bridge and he sees someone about to jump and he saves them from jumping off the bridge and then the guy that he saved says well now you owe me because you you took a big step in my life and now you owe me and so that was the old understanding of initiation so th that doesn't seem exactly to me what's happening this is more sudden and more um immediate so the way we've been doing it is we first go into the community first we're invited in we're not coming in with a bunch of uh, ideas and trying to lay it on people. We're invited in because of the suffering and the pain. Uh, and then we invite those in the community who want to do mentoring, we call it mentoring, who want to be involved in some mentoring process to work with us so that as we're working with the young people, we're also working with the mentors. And so we may go through this or that during the day. And this is all happening in the neighborhood and the, in the midst of everything that's typically going on in their lives. And uh, then in the evening, we sit down with the, those that are interested in mentoring and discuss what happened and how it happened and what we did, why we did it, what might we do next. And then um, as, if it, the process goes on long enough, then... We try to help those who want to do the mentoring form their own local mentoring organization because ultimately mentoring is local. You know, you can take something, you might learn it. Well, we were working a lot in uh, Los Angeles and within a couple of miles, you have the African-American community, several of them, and you have the uh, more or less Latino communities, uh, different ones there too, Central American as well as Mexican and so on. And if you took what you learned in one place and went to the other place, it might not work. There are differences just within a couple of miles. So that taught me that mentoring is local. So then we would try to help people form a, a mentoring organization there using what they know about their culture and whoever's involved. And then we would tr try to support that process with them so that it wasn't us doing a bunch of mentoring from a central organization trying to inspire the process of mentoring and considering initiatory ideas in that local community. Mm -hmm. And so then the support would come from the community. Um, you know, I'm like more like an itinerant storyteller. I wander around. And so I'm not going to be there to do the typical work that you would have in traditional cultures where everybody's on the same ground and working uh, their psychic ground while they're living on the same ground. 
I'm more coming in to inspire through stories and help people do some work. And then, then we do what's called mentoring the mentors, try to keep advising and nourishing and sending help to the mentors who then are working with the young people. So it's, uh, it's a little different than traditional, more established way of doing things. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, going back to the book, I found your writing about the relationship between the small self and the deep self or soul to be very much in line with yogic philosophy, particularly uh, a concept called avidya, which is a misperception that we are the small self instead of the mm, deeper self that seems to have always been there and is unchanging. And I wonder if you could speak a little about this relationship. Yeah. Um, I also give this part there where I'm talking about the eyes of initiation. Like the when the infant is born, it opens its eyes typically and begins to focus and try to see the world. That's the first set of eyes. And the, there was another idea, which was the soul has a deeper set of eyes that an initiatory experience opens the eyes of the soul which already have their own vision. The soul has its own vision of life, which I think would be called vidya, as opposed to avidya, which is the ego's distorted sense of life. Interesting to be, in a sense, on video a lot, and that word video comes from vidya and avidya. And so I'm using a combination of things I've learned from stories, and then Carl Jung's work which comes from Eastern philosophy where he called it the little self and the great self within and again it's a more of a psychological understanding that when we're born or shortly thereafter we have to formulate a little ego which is fashioned out of the circumstances of family and some characteristics of the little infant and I think that little self is formed in order to not experience annihilation in order to to have some sense of personal presence uh, in a uh, described fashion. Um, and then the ego becomes like a double agent. On one hand, it's connected to the deep self. It can't, you can't have a complete disconnection, I don't think. But on the other hand, it's obscuring the deep self so that the little self feels it's in charge um, when it really isn't. It's like a a uh, pretend ruler on a shaky throne. On a good day, it might pull something off, but most of the time it's making stuff up. And then when we get hit by a real blow from the world, the little self can't handle that. And then two things happen. We just lose our sense of self or we find the deeper sense of self. And of course, one of the great things in the Western world, I think recently is Eastern practices coming into the Western world and Eastern philosophies which say essentially that what we're looking for is within ourselves. It's tremendously useful if the outside world around us is unraveling. We have a place to go deep inside if people understand they have a deep self or a deep soul. And then one small problem, going from the little self to the deep self requires going through what I call the emotional zone, which is in between, which is all of a person's fears and anxiety. And, and sorrows and losses and betrayals that exist between the two. Otherwise, everybody would go there right away and stop all the fooling around. So there's a reason why we're not all bound, connected to the deep self, and it usually has to do with some history and prehistory of internal concerns and worries and anxieties and fears. Yeah, it's interesting. You uh, described the soul as being as consisting of water and earth and together those make mud and like when we're doing that soul work it's we really got to go into the muck which yeah. can be uh, a little scary and i think there's also a fear and i don't know if this is a fear generated by the ego it you know i guess it must be but a fear that if we go down and in and, and connect with the soul and start to live with live from that place, you know, being guided by our inner wisdom and intuition and our soul's calling, that 
it is going to disconnect us from the world that we've been living in. You know, it might uh, feel like we're going to be disconnected from our family or our, you know, our career. Those type of things may not feel in alignment with the soul. And so I think uh, it's kind of like a dangerous path to go down because once you make that connection, I don't know if there's any going back, you know, even when things get tough, there's no just like turning that off and being blissfully ignorant again. Yeah, it, it, it's in fact initiatory. It's, it's a, it really right. can't turn back because it's an initiatory path and a person is leaving parts of themselves behind that are no longer vital or serving the cause, uh, the cause of awakening up or growing a greater life. And so you have, you can take the initiatory dynamic and turn it all inside, which in Eastern practices is often the majority of what's happening, or you can see it more as outside as in a vision quest kind of style. So yeah, that's the problem. Whenever anyone undertakes something meaningful where their whole self and soul becomes committed, and that can be a relationship as well, then there's no really going back. That's a genuine step. And the word initiation means to step into, to initiate something. But when you initiate something that's life changing, soul changing, there is no way back. There's only ways forward. So it's that old fear of death again. Yeah. <laughs> so then you want it. So just as you have little self and big self, you have little death and big death. Mm. So I call it little D death and big D death. Big D death is the door we're all headed for. You know, so far, no one gets out of this alive, more or less. <laughs> so, or as they say in Africa, death is in the fold of your shirt, that we're carrying our death with mm -hmm. us wherever we go. It's not morbid. It's just understanding that if, if the more people understand there's a limited time, you don't know when it's going to come, but the end does come. It doesn't make a person morbid, the exact opposite. It makes us value more the life we have, which in mythology is called the gift of life, not the accidental presence of life, but the gift of life. And I'm saying that that's unique and that's a quality, quality that makes each person deserving of respect and understanding. And so, but then there's little d death, which psychologically we can call the death of the ego in a given moment. Uh, the death of the little self, the end of childhood at some point, but also the death of the idea that I'm superior or the death that I, of the idea that I, I actually know what I'm doing. Mm. And so the idea is as long as there's a number of little D deaths, or as Rumi says, die before you die, uh, then the big D death is not quite as scary. And we're supposed to arrive, and I, I get to this in the book a little bit, we're supposed to unburden the heart as we live so that when we get to the end, if it's a, a long life, not suddenly interrupted, um, we have a lighter heart when we die. And, and I use the old Egyptian story in the book. Um, after a person dies, their heart is weighed against the feather of truth, against a single feather of truth. And if the heart has been unburdened and a per person's heart has become light, because they gave what they had in their heart to the world. Then at the end, they land in the ancestral land and they're accepted there. If a person dies with a heavy heart, having not unburdened themselves of what they had to give, or even unburdened themselves of mm, kind of forgiving, forgiving people and being forgiven by other people, then what happens is that heavy heart is too heavy for the scales of truth. And then in the old stories, it gets eaten by a monster, which seems pretty unpleasant, but then the person starts over again, um, gets another chance to try and live the genuine life. It seems to me that if we grew up with stories like that one in our culture, that we would think so much differently about our lives and our contributions to the world, yeah? Yeah. Well, that's one of the problems. We've fallen out of story and um, we don't have enough coherent stories. And then from my point of view, 
uh, myth is a living thing. It's like the archetype of initiation doesn't really go away. It just falls into the bottom of the soul and waits to be found again. And the stories don't go away. You can find them. They, they, you know, they exist here and there. And so I go around telling old stories and trying to find the connections to what we're living through right now. So like one of the biggest stories we're living through, I think, is the unraveling of culture and the upheaval of nature happening at the same time, very dramatic time to be alive. And then fortunately enough, there's a bunch of old stories about how the world falls apart and renews itself. So I think we're in that moment of collapse renewal, that moment of chaos and creation. And we have to, I think, witness and acknowledge all that's being lost and all that has been lost throughout history in a way. But at the same time, we hopefully can find a way of picking up the, a thread that's meaningful and beginning to weave that thread back into the world as a way of our small contribution to lending ourselves to the ongoing creation of the world. In the Western world, people pretend that creation was back there and then history went on and we're distant from it. In the mythological world, creation is here right now. It's ongoing all the time, every day. And we're being called to join the reweaving of the world that is also happening while the world is collapsing. That's the story I'm interested in. Mm. So that becomes almost an initiation on a cultural level, if people can imagine it that way. Hmm. Yeah, this loss of imagination was something I was thinking about earlier, actually. My wife, uh, she's an astrologer, and she was recently featured in a New York Times article on astrology. And the comments on the article were, for the most part, like very negative, negative and uh, denigrating astrology as an unscientific uh, waste of time and complete nonsense. And I wonder if the materialist scientific worldview that many Westerners subscribe to, is it just another way for them to cope with uncertainty and existential fear, like an attempt to find a solid ground to stand on. Like they're looking for the same things that me and you might look to mythology or old traditions for. Um, but what the, the direction they're going in is really cutting them off from uh, the fuller aspects of, of life. You know what I'm getting at? I do. Hopefully it's a stage, right? So you do some deconstruction, you get all the way down to the bottom and you find out that there is renewal at the bottom of the deconstruction. I'm saying that's the myth we're living in right now is collapse renewal. They're heavily on the collapse side, on the deconstruction side. Um, his astrology is astro logic. So you have logic, which everybody's in favor of now. Everybody, what the world pretends they're doing. You know, they're, terribly uh, erratic for people that are logical. But anyway, they, they, that's the belief system is logical. And then you have mythologic, which is the logic of narrative, the logic of myth, which is tremendous logic of its own, narrative intelligence, sharing stories, understanding life as a story. And then you have astrologic, which is the logic of stars and planets. And, and just to dismiss it because you don't understand it, it's not that impressive, but it's really familiar. And so it might make a comeback because if you take astrophysicists who have gone down studying the origin of stars and all mm -hmm. and gotten to the idea where there was that original unique event, they often call it the explosion of the star that got everything going. And they have picked up an idea which mythology has had all along. In mythology, they say everything at the beginning. And astrophysicists now say, in order for something to be now, it had to be there in some form at the beginning. So they've arrived at a mythological idea, at a mythological idea from their, uh, their scientific physical study. And so I think astrology could make its comeback as well. I mean, astrology is obvious. 
a person's soul is born at a certain moment. At that moment, you mark where all the stars and planets were, and you have a diagram of the relationship of the individual soul to the living cosmos. Obvious, <laughs> but it's obvious in an imaginative way, not obvious in a logical, let's study the facts way. Mm. And so, I don't know, I think we're probably on our way back. The, those astrophysicists now count the amount of stardust that falls on the earth every year. It's like tons and tons, I don't know, tens of thousands of tons of stardust which doesn't lay there, it gets absorbed by plants and trees. And when we eat vegetables and things, we're eating stardust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we are the stars, which was astrological ideas to begin with. Astrology was saying, we are born of the stars. In the book, I give the old Western story, I call it the forgotten story of how each soul is at the center of the cosmos before it's born that we are deeply connected to the soul of the world and we're connected to cosmology as well as history. And so you could also say, strangely, we're cosmologically dislocated now. When, when they had the idea the earth was the center of the universe, everybody said, hey, we're right in the middle, we're cool. And, and then they said, oh no, it's not the center. It must be the sun and our sun is the center and we're going around the center. And then they found out, oh no, the sun's not in the center. And so they said, well, there, maybe there is no center, it's eccentric. And that led them to the idea of the accidental universe when it could have led them to the idea if there's no precise center somewhere, then the center's everywhere as soon as you center yourself. And I think that's what Eastern practices are saying that if you center in the deep self, you're connected to the cosmos. And uh, so I prefer those old stories and those old ideas, and they're very reassuring if you can feel that centering, grounding, no matter what the chaos is around us. Mm. Yeah, I really love your use of language, and I can tell that you ascribe a lot of value to understanding words and their origins. And it brings up something for me that actually, um, you know, reading in your book, you use the word psyche. And the word psyche, correct me if I'm wrong, originally referred to the breath of life or the soul. And it always bothers me when I hear a word like psychedelic defined as mind manifesting. When my experience has been that psychedelics bring me into contact with my soul, drawing deep insights and inspiration up into my conscious mind. And I'm wondering if you think the loss of the old meanings of words like psyche contributes to the loss of soul understanding in our culture. Well, in a way, people lost the other world. So every culture had its way of talking of the other world. It's the ancestral world, it's the world of myth, whatever. They had some way of, of describing the fact that humans live in two worlds at the same time. The Irish have a really simple way of saying it, one step and you're in the other world. And the other world has everything that isn't in this world and it has the origins of everything that is in this world. And so people used to understand that we're these dual beings. Our feet are walking on the goat's earth, earth, as they used to say, but our imaginations are reaching to the top of heaven or the whole cosmos. And so what happened is a reductionism of ideas and imagination so that psyche becomes something way diminished rather than the spirit of life. And so psychology is even diminished because people don't recognize that first word as say the spirit of life and then you would have psych psyche logos the logic of the spirit living yeah. inside everybody yeah. and so the so previous book i wrote is called the genius myth and what i was trying to do there is take a really western word genius which is primarily a roman word maybe going back a little earlier than the Romans, but it's roughly Roman, which doesn't mean high IQ, and it doesn't mean specific talent. It means the spirit that's already there. 
And that means that when a person is born, they are born with a genius, the spirit that's already there. And that genius is trying to wake up and that genius has its gifts to give. And that genius is what calling calls to. It calls to the original spirit that came to life with that person, but we lost that story or we didn't completely lose it because the image for the genius in the soul is a single candle with a burning flame and and it now exists as the birthday candle. And what I mean is it used to be that in the house there would be a place, a shrine. And on a person's birthday, the anniversary of their birth, they would light the single candle, no matter what age a person was, it was one candle. And the birthday gifts would be given to the genius, not to the person. In other words, they were trying to nourish the inner living spirit of the person. And we have fallen so far away from realizing that that individual spirit is in the house in the form of each person that all that's left from that, in a sense, is the birthday candle, um, when it really meant the anniversary of the birth of the genius that the person brought to life. But these things don't disappear. They just fall out of awareness, and they come back. And so one good thing about being in a chaotic world, chaos precedes creation. It's just like working with young people lost in the streets. They're actually sometimes closer to awakening because they're not held by things anymore. And we're culturally in chaos, not being held by things. And it's very painful and confusing. And yet in some ways, it makes us closer to waking up to all the things that have been lost and forgotten that can't disappear. They just fall back into the soul. I love this um, this teaching about the single candle, um, and you know that's something I got a birthday coming up, and that's something I'm gonna bring back into my life. Is you know I don't have birthday cakes anymore, but I'm gonna bring back that candle and honor that soul that came into being when I came into being. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm wondering, like, so I love that idea. Are there other ways that we can help to cultivate a connection to the soul in our in our modern lives? Well, soul is considered to be the connective tissue of life. And so anywhere we are genuinely connected, that's soul for us. Or another way to imagine it is whatever I love or even whoever I love is a soul connection to the world. And and those kind of connections benefit both souls. So we have the soul that we originally came in with. And then our work in the world is making more soul in the world. So when someone decides I'm living in this place, this is my place for, you know, how that can happen. You arrive somewhere and you go, wow, this is it. I feel better here. I dream better. I don't know how people decide. And when a person decides to make that a meaningful space to live in, they're adding soul to the world and to that space. And they're deepening their own soul by growing roots down. Mm. So the places that we love, the things that we love, the people that we love are where the soul is awake for us. And when the soul is present, there's more vitality. And the deepest power of the soul, they used to say, Well, I think there's two deep powers, but they used to say the deepest power is imagination. I think maybe there's two, imagination and love. What we love has soul for us, and that gives us imagination. And so we, on one level, our job is to make the world soulful again. And we can only do that by very personal connections to place, people, and, and, and work, as they call it now. And so... For me, there's a connection between calling, which tries to awaken and bring the natural genius of a person into full expression. Um, That's one thing. And then the avenues or the connections to the world through love. Uh, There's an African proverb that says, what we love is the cure. Hmm. It's the cure for what? ails us for our own soul wounds and in the loving of that thing that's going to have an effect on a on a greater level yeah yeah so 
I'm lately using the, and in the book, using the term initiation a little bit more widely than I used to in the sense that I believe we're in this need for a collective awakening. You know, the climate change issues say that and the cultural oppression issues say that. So I often think of it as three big crises, climate change, global warming, the biggest crises because it's affecting the entire planet. And then the humanitarian crisis, which crises, which has to do with misogyny and racism and oppression of all kinds, which is all over the planet again. And then at the, the third one down is the crisis of meaning and truth, I think. And uh, in other words, people now say in the United States politics, we're in a post-truth world or there is no truth. Well, that's a decimation of the soul. The soul longs for truth, truth in loving, truth in expression, truth in imagination. So it seems to me that the way it might work is if we can do something about the loss of truth and meaning, if we can live the truth from within ourselves out and live lives of meaning, then we add soul to the world. That adds connectivity to the world. And then that begins to work on the other two crises. I don't think we can solve the crises of climate, which is nature, and the crises of, of uh, humanitarian issues, which is culture, unless we can awaken uh, to the deep meaning of our own individual souls. I think we can legitimately, legitimately act from that place. So we have to do that awakening, I think, in order to be effective with handling the two bigger crises. That's how I'm thinking. Personally. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, I mean, that's heartening because it feels like we can actually do something. Because if we look at the the big picture, the largest crisis, it just feels insurmountable. And, you know, I heard someone say the other day that they're projecting that somewhere like 15, 20 years from now, we'll be at the point of no return unless we make some radical change. Like 2020. And, and that feels just like, well, what's the point then, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how it feels. And, but So I, w I wrote a book called Why the World Doesn't End. Hmm. It's a collection of recreation stories from all around the world and how the, in one story the whole world, global heating, it burns to ash and there's nothing left but ashes. Everything's gone. But there happen to be these two characters that were in the other world when this world burned up. It's a charming mythological thing. And they find their way back, and all they can find is ashes. It's very discouraging. And so one of them is kicking in the ashes and kicks something hard and hoping that his food goes down in the ashes and gets it and just a charred, a piece of charcoal, burned remnant of a tree. And is very disappointed that it's not food, but then thinks, you know, people used to make drums out of trees. And so the character starts playing this charcoal drum, and that at least tires him out and he falls asleep in the ashes. But when he wakes up, out of that little piece of charcoal is coming a green tendril. And now he understands what he has to do. He has to play the drum and sing in order to bring life back. And out of that piece of charcoal comes the green tendril that becomes the tree of life from which grows all the trees and all the species of trees again. And the animals come back and the birds come back and eventually people come back and the whole world comes back from a piece of charcoal that was turned into a drum. And so it's a shamanic story. It's a story about waking up one soul and connecting to something that looked lifeless, but it's carbon. And even the scientists could jump in there and talk about how that contributes to life. And so I extract from those stories the idea not that we need any heroic saving of the earth. We need a kind of humble saving of ourselves. And then if a person walks the calling of their life, letting their own genius awaken and somehow trusting that, then what happens? You reach an intersection one day where all you're doing is living out your own life and you hit a place where you can affect greater lives because of what you've learned about yourself or because you've learned how to give your gift. And if enough people awaken that way and hit those intersections, then without anybody heroically carrying the whole thing, things start to awaken the way a forest can regrow from the ground up after a volcano has annihilated the forest. 
I think that's what we're in. Live our own truth, not some pronouncement of a true idea, the truth embodied in the life I'm living because I was called to go this way can lead to helping other things awaken and other people awaken. And eventually that becomes, I think, I hope, the collective initiation. Hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And you know, it's funny, I was going to ask you about singing and drumming, because that's something that you've done for a long time. And, you know, I was going to ask you if that's uh, like, what's the role of rhythm in music and awakening the soul? But I think you've already answered that. So it's a lot to the world. And, and it's funny, I found that story. It's a South American story. Um, and from the Amazon, a small tribe on the Amazon River. And I happened to find the story um, after I had been dreaming that I was playing a piece of hard burnt wood mm-hmm. and I couldn't get any sound out of it. And I was and I, and I was really frustrated and discouraged in the dream. I had the dream like several times. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? Am I doing something wrong with music? What am I doing? And then I found that story, which then explained to me that sometimes you have to play on a hard drum. Sometimes you have to play on something that seems to be dead and useless. And but out of that, out of that effort to play, something can awaken. That creativity can occur even when the player is feeling defeated. Mm. Well, I think that's a great place to finish our conversation. feels like a hopeful note. Yes, it is. It is, and a rhythm. So the two things, we talked about it. In in the Western world, they say in the beginning was the word, which is a a cool beginning, and it should make all of us etymologists. We should all be studying words in the beginning. But in tribal places, they say in the beginning was the sound, which means everybody should be a musician and somehow contributing their note to the world. And that that might add to the collective harmony that begins to bring back a greater, deeper understanding of what a human being really is. Mm. I think it's important to say, too, that that might mean that you're a helpful, considerate bank teller or a an alert and kind bus driver. It doesn't necessarily mean we have to be wearing feathers and, and playing drums and rattles, right? Because if we all did that, then society would really fall apart. <laughs> oh, or not. We'd be in a different society. <laughs> it's interesting you mention the bank because the genius of some people is what we call money. Mm. Yep. So it, it wasn't originally money. It was the marketplace, the exchange of things. And there's people that are genius at that. And if they understood that capacity as their God-given, nature-given, spirit-given genius, then they would understand the second part of that. If you're good at accumulating things and exchanging things, all you now have to do is be good at contributing to nature and helping other people. And then rather than accumulating everything from oneself, all the genius of trade and deal making goes into making it better for everybody. That's a legitimate genius that can be very helpful. Yeah. 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 I'm just kind of referring to what happens to some people when they go to the Amazon or they go to a retreat that's really inspiring and it's, they want to sometimes give up what they've done in the past, which may have been their true calling, their genius like you said, you know, I don't have the genius of um, money handling or anything like that. <laughs> I have other geniuses. So I need people who can help me with those other aspects of life that are so important. And um, yeah, so not to give everything up and become a healer or a shaman or something like that. But that's the calling. And if that's the calling, understand you will suffer. <laughs> yeah. It's not the easy road. I always say to the would-be healers, uh, if they're if you're you're in the wound business, or else you have no business. So so whoever wants to be a healer has to be very interested in being in proximity of the wounds, and whoever wants to be a shaman usually has to live way out on the edge of town, and people only come when they're in trouble. So be careful what you wish for. Yeah, you're gonna get desperate people. Um, well, okay, this brings up something maybe we can finish on. Just from a, from my own personal perspective, you know, I'm going to turn 44 uh, in a couple months. And you know, I've been uh, teaching for about, you know, six or seven years now. 
And I'm wondering if for you, was there a time that you noticed people starting to take you more seriously or trusting you as a teacher, healer, guide, whatever that work is for you? Do you know what I'm getting at? Like, I think sometimes, uh, I think, you know, earlier in my life, I wouldn't, how do I want to put this? I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone didn't trust me because I was still carrying some old wounds and I, and I wasn't fully grown up yet. Maybe I wasn't fully initiated or something. And I'm wondering if this is something that happened in your life where you noticed that people really started to be more receptive to you and trust you more? Well, I think it, it wasn't necessarily a chronological a pathway like that is I think the more risks I have taken uh, in being genuinely myself, which includes storytelling and includes, you know, drumming and, and various things that I didn't know I was going to be doing. And, at, and when I was younger, I was afraid to do. The more genuinely that I have stepped into that, I think the more that um, the channeling activity of teaching um, becomes manifest. So, um, so on the way, yet um, on in one way, the, the development of the person learning to understand one's own genius and how to how to meet it and be with it, because the genius isn't the person; it's the spirit that was in the person from before birth. So that's a whole inner negotiation, mm -hmm. and then how to manifest that outwardly. And so what I started to notice was the more genuine I could be. You know, like, so I collect stories. I love stories. Stories have saved my life more than once. And I write about some of it in the book and various books. Um, but then I could be walking towards a stage or a situation where I was going to tell a story. And I have a little plan in my mind. I love this story. I'm going to tell this one. My foot hits the stage and the whole of the story comes in. It just arrives. Now, that's a big choice. Am I going to stick with the plan or am I going to go with what spirit just delivered? I've learned to go with what just came in and learn what, what it's about as it unfolds. And to me, that's kind of, that's an aspect of teaching, at least on the road that I'm on, that trust in the unseen has to be part of the teaching. And so that, that's, that was a scary thing to me at first. I'd be confused and, and I couldn't straighten out inside myself what am I supposed to be doing? And then I realized, oh, storytelling is channeling in a way. And teaching is also, there's a really old idea that I love that says that knowledge is pouring through this world so rapidly that people don't notice it. And you need something to slow the knowledge down in order to notice it. Know it notice it. And one thing that slows it down is having a practice that's appropriate to the person that slows down the knowledge enough to grasp it Another thing that slows it down is a teacher. A good teacher is not building up knowledge. They're slowing down the knowledge that's pouring into the world every moment. A good practice is slowing down the knowledge, and a good story slows down the knowledge. So that kind of helped me. As there's some maturation, hopefully that happens, and then there's this amazing moment that's trying to happen all the time, and how uh, legitimately can I approach that moment or allow myself to be pulled into that moment has become interesting to me. Yeah. Again, this like, this really resonates with me. Uh, I remember when I first started teaching, I would often, you know, I'd feel a little insecure or nervous. So I'd come up with a plan for what I was going to teach. And, uh, it always felt kind of stiff. And eventually I realized, you know what, I'm feeling held back by these plans. What would happen if I went in with no plan? And I had, you know, a teacher who would throw me into situations where I was totally unprepared, unsuspecting, and he would kind of like push me out on the stage and say, okay, now teach. And I'd have to just go with it. And that's when I really started to learn the power of going in clear and open and learning to trust that something is going to come through. Like it's always there. It seems to be an inexhaustible resource. So yeah. now, now I have no fear. And in fact, I... I never come up with plans because I know the best stuff comes through is when I'm just like 
open and present with the people. And it seems that in those moments, the things that are actually relevant to the people in the room come through rather than something I was thinking about last week and I thought was a cool idea and like, man, I can't wait to share this with people that are going to think I'm really clever, you know? <laughs> well, it can happen. But yeah, that, but what happens then is the audience or the students or whatever we want to call them, um, what their presence is informing the entire process. Learning happens between both. That the, the, the dynamic of learning, the archetypal energy of it, requires an awakened student and an awakened teacher, just the way healing requires not just a healer, but it requires someone who's ready to be healed. The dynamic includes both. And so that makes the teacher eventually thankful for the students if, if they happen to come. And I think the whole practice, whatever it might be, would be trying to be present to the moment that's trying to open. And I love this old idea that the knowledge is pouring through so fast people can't see it. And then our job is to find ways to slow it down, either by having a practice or for some of us, kind of teaching is the practice through which things slow down enough to become known. Mm. And the thing I, I feel about the kind of stories that you tell is that I can't really engage with them with my logical mind. And so it kind of like arrests that analytical, logical thinking, like slows it down. It's like putting a stick in the gears or something. And it forces things like, like it forces me out of uh, kind of linear time and into this liminal zone, yes. almost like a Zen koan or something, you know, like, and it's just like maybe an understanding of the story that I can only feel, but maybe not be able to articulate. Yeah. Yeah. That's the job is to step into that. I think the job of ritual as well, the ritual is in something that's predetermined with all the pieces having to be done perfectly. I don't, I don't think that's the radical, most radical form of ritual. The radical form of ritual is to bring us to a place where the unknown appears, or as they say in certain African places, to where the spirit, we allow ourselves to be found by spirit. We're just trying to go far enough into the ceremony or the ritual that the unseen then comes to meet us. And I think the same is true in, in teaching that uh, it's not, well, anyway, the moment is always trying to crack open, the Greek called kairos, the opportune moment where the moment becomes momentous. And that happened for the teacher as well as the student, for the healer as well as the patient. It's a, it's a mutual dynamic where the investment, the attention, the presence of both creates the third thing. Therapy is the same thing. You have the therapist and you have the, whatever they call them nowadays, the, the suffering person. <laughs> and, and when both become present, then the third thing enters, and that's when the healing occurs. In mythology, it's always the third thing. So the, the uh, speaker in the audience creating a third thing that wasn't happening otherwise the storyteller and the people listening to the story all wind up in the story and everybody gets something they didn't have before because story means storehouse and the stories give freely. Mm -hmm. And so it's just getting into the dynamic and having some sense of what part I'm called to play. And then that kind of whatever you call it, the self-sacrifice or the humility to let the unknown, the spirit, soul come present and something unexpected happens and that unexpected is called creation happening again mm. after that we feel more human and more connected to everything nature and culture yeah and I, I feel like uh, if we try to structure the ritual or the event too much we don't leave enough space for the spirit to enter um, and I've definitely been in kind of ceremonies, rituals that people were trying really hard to kind of get all the things in and they just didn't have the same juice as, you know, something that was more kind of simple and spontaneous where just friends were gathered. Maybe there's a fire, maybe there's a story, maybe there's a song, 
but there's a lot of space there and then in that space i feel like yeah that third thing is able yeah. to enter in and yeah and even if it's a well-known ritual it's there as my understanding to lure spirit to the moment and then that is also communitas communitas which makes what i call sudden community which may be what we're really looking for is not necessarily a precise enduring community that's hard to sustain and require requires lots of rules and regulations but a sudden community um, where in everyone present gets fed something they need it mm. that's what i imagine that's what i'm usually looking for yeah beautiful well i'm gonna let you go we could sit here and talk about the soul and, and this kind of stuff all day long Think about the soul all day all night Well, I really appreciate you taking this much time with me, Michael, and um, I'm going to link everyone to your website and recommend that everybody read this book at this time. I think uh, it is it is definitely food for the soul, and it's nourishing food. Good. Well, thank you. Good talking with you, Brian. Yeah, likewise. Hope to see you down the road. All right. I'll look forward to that. Yeah. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.